Today is April 27th, 2021, and my guest is author Ian Leslie. He writes the newsletter The Ruffian, and his latest book is Conflicted, How Productive Disagreements Lead to Better Outcomes. Ian, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. It's a great honor to be here. Your book opens by asking, what's getting in the way of our productive conversations? In theory, conversations are more than just passing time. Econ Talk, I like to think about as a a way we learn things from each other and those listening in get to share in that, but often doesn't work out that way. Why? Well, one of the key features of of a productive conversation is a conflict of views, right? The the moment you get into a a conflict of views or, or a disagreement is the moment that you you have to think a bit, a bit harder about why you said that or why you think that. You have to examine your own assumptions and, and find arguments and reasons for your point of view. Um, and a lot of us find that process very stressful. In fact, most of us find it stressful or uncomfortable to some degree. And, and so disagreement and argument is something that we often shy away from. Or the, the, the opposite problem is we do it so aggressively and clumsily that the conversation just becomes noise and, and, and is, is, you know, sheds no light, just, you know, just generates heat. Um, so the, the really the kind of the mission of the book is to help us have better disagreements, you know, better to, to express our differences directly and openly but in a way that that generates light rather than just heat. I think a lot of people are conflict averse, right? They, um, in America right now, and I'm sure it's also true in in the UK and elsewhere, certain issues have become so charged, uh, political issues, ideology differences. Sometimes it's religion, but right now often it's, it's politics, which can be a religion. Uh, very passionately held, often connects us to people who we feel in community with uh, the way religion can. And so those conversations, as you say, are either not taking place because people are afraid of raising a, a quote, dangerous topic, or they become shouting matches. Uh, why is it important to have those conversations? Wouldn't it be better just to leave them alone? You know, it doesn't, isn't polite Dinner talk uh, avoid such such thorny topics. Yeah, I you know what I when I started. It's a rhetorical thinking about question, this, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, when I started thinking about this this book, um, it, and it was really just kind of looking around at the the public discourse and seeing all the, the terrible, toxic arguments that people were getting into, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to write a book about how it basically how to avoid that. You know, how to avoid confrontational conflict and and let's just find a way we can just talk everything through really calmly and the more i thought about it the more i reflected on it, it the more it seemed like that's a it's sort of that the toxicity is really the tip of the iceberg well, the, the real problem is that because partly because we see all those terrible arguments on social media now we avoid it we shy away from it altogether. So because we see disagreement going wrong, we, we go, okay, well, disagreement is clearly a bad thing. And I, I don't want to get into that. Um, and, but when we do that, we just miss out on the immense benefits of disagreement and conflict. Because dis- disagreement is basically a way of thinking. Um, it, and it, it, may, it may be the way of thinking, actually, you know, in the book, I, I argue that uh, it, it's, it's, you know, we are actually evolved to, to, to think in concert with, with other people that essentially our intelligence is essentially interactive and collaborative. Um, and that, you know, most thinking is not best done in, in magnificent isolation and, you know, kind of like Rodin's the, the thinker, so a very deep person just kind of going deep inside their own mind. Um, we we actually do much better thinking when we're in groups where we are disagreeing with each other and we're kind of making the best case that, that we can for our point of view and then listening to, to what, what the others say. 
Um, it, there's a couple more benefits. You know, I think it makes us smarter. So I think when we avoid it, it make you know we get a bit stupider. There's a couple more things. What one is we, it actually counterintuitively brings us closer together when we do it well, because as, as one psychologist said to me, a psychologist who studies um, couples relationships, she said, look, conflict is information. You know, in, in an argument with your partner or indeed, you know, your colleague or whatever, you're learning about them, right? You're learning about what they really care about, what they really think when the veil of civility or passivity is kind of stripped away or lifted a little bit. Um, and that will update your model of, of, of who they are, right? And, and that ultimately will bring you closer. And if you don't do it, you, you'll just sort of drift apart with, without, you know, a, a, an angry word exchanged. And then a third reason, just, just you know, briefly is, is related to the first one, really, which is, which is creativity and, and innovation, which we know, you know, comes from the clash of different insights and different points of view. And disagreement and argument is, can be an incredibly, you know, a real engine of, of creative thought. Yeah, I want to start with that, the very first point you made in that answer, which I like to think about as, as being true. Uh, it might not be true, but I think part of it is certainly true, which is that we evolve to disagree. We evolve to think in groups. And I think that's such a, actually quite a radical idea. Part of it's because of that romance we have about the lonely thinker, you know, me in my armchair, which is underrated, by the way, also. But, <laughs> you know, because I think most of us have trouble thinking for anything more than 10 or 15 seconds these days. But having deep, the ability to think deeply about something for a long time is a very powerful, I think, thing for an individual. But more, po even more powerful is after you've done that, to, to let your argument rub up against somebody else's argument for checking and rethinking uh, so many great ideas I've had after I've talked to them with someone, I realized, hmm, not such a great idea, or even more importantly, great idea if I change this. Uh, and I think it's one of the things I hate about debate is debate are just two people yelling. Uh, conversation is that give and take, back and forth, exploration, emergent phenomenon that I think is greatly underrated as a way of, of learning and as a way of thinking. And I think that, um, I think we underappreciate, especially today when people are afraid to speak their mind increasingly, I don't think people are aware often of what we're losing. What we're losing is the ability to discover things together. And that's just, um, it's the backbone of civilization. I agree, and in fact, you know, almost literally, it's it's the it's the backbone or the, or the foundation of Western thought. Um, and, and you know, you've had Agnes Callard on on this pack podcast, and, and I was influenced by her ideas on this. And, and you know, she talks about Socrates, and you know, Socrates didn't write anything down. Famously, <laughs> um, he distrusted this, you know, writing, which. It's probably like the smartphone today, you know, a, a, a new technology that the, the older generation slightly distrusted. And, and the reason he didn't trust it was that it couldn't talk back. Um, and he couldn't engage it in, in, in a, a, you know, a piece of papyrus in, in a conversation. Um, and so, you know, he clearly thought, you know, he basically laid the foundation stone of Western inquiry, which is, you know, we get together and and we work things out in in dispute and 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 and, and argument, um, and Agnes calls it the the division of epistemic labour. You know, you have different people in the group taking different points of view, and that enables those different points of view to 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 come together and kind of bounce off each other or clash and and, and fuse whatever it is. And there's a really interesting um, theory from a um, couple of evolutionary psychologists. Mercier and Sperber, um, who have a, a yeah kind of evolutionary take on this, where they basically suggest that our biases are actually only flaws if you look at the individual. Once once you think about it, once you accept that thinking is in, interactive, that, that thinking is essentially a, a collaborative activity, you see that our biases can actually contribute to the intelligence of the group. Because if you're in a group of people 
and everybody's trying to make their best case for their particular point of view, and everybody's motivated to do that, then you get uh, a Darwinian process of, of generation and, and uh, variation uh, and selection. Uh, you know, the weakest arguments, because you're motivated not just to make your own case, but to knock out the other arguments, right? So, so the weak arguments will get weeded out quickly, and the strong ones will, uh, the most robust ones will survive. Um, so in that sense, they, you know, they see confirmation bias as, as, as a bug if you're thinking on your own, um, but a feature if you're thinking as part of the group. But what that, what that, you know, for that to go well, for that model to work properly, you've got to have participants who are doing both at once, essentially trying to make the best case they can as individuals, but at the same time kind of having at least part of their brain thinking what matters is not that I am right. At the end of the day, what matters is that we are right as, as a group. Yeah, I think that's extremely deep. It was one of my favorite insights from the book, by the way, and I'm just going to quote the line that summarizes this uh, the approach. You say, we don't just do our thinking in the brain, however, we do it with each other. And this evolutionary, potentially correct, who knows, but it's so thought provoking. This idea that confirmation bias, which I make fun of all the time on this program and, and realizing how much I have of it <laughs> over time uh, is a fascinating thing. And those those two psychologists, um, uh, are they psychologists, Mercer and? They're evolutionary psychologists. Yeah, yeah, cognitive psychologists with an evolutionary background. And what's their names again? Sperber and Mercier. Yeah, Mercier and Sperber. Uh, this idea that confirmation bias, they you say they call it my side bias. So mm. I have a bias toward my side. Sure, okay. But that just makes me a better arguer, which is important. You don't mean to just dismiss my view quickly and immediately glom on to someone else's view. This idea that I spar with you, I give you my best argument, and I'm difficult to persuade is a disaster, as you say, for myself. But in a group, it's great. And the key, I think, is this is the point that you have to share a goal. So, so in a marriage or a workplace environment where, where the, the organization ha has an overarching goal and you can put down your ego, which is incredibly hard to do in either a marriage or a workplace situation, but if you can do that, then argument is fabulous because you learn where the best place to go is that you otherwise wouldn't be aware of. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a great paradox, you know, for, for, in order for a group to think rationally, you know, at least some of the members should behave at least somewhat irrationally. Yeah, that, that's, how, <laughs> that's how I would sum it up. And, and for me, it, you know, it's a great insight because it, it, uh, it aligns with, with another kind of uh, one of the things I wanted to get right in the book, which is that um, argument and disagreement should be emotional, right? It, it there's a kind of idea that actually, you know, the problem with it is, is we get emotional about things and we just, it's quite a male kind of view of the world. We just take emotion out of it and we just talk about facts and, and, and rational points of view. Then, you know, every disagreement can be sorted out in this kind of, you know, like an Oxford seminar. Um, and to me, that seems both unrealistic um, and also pretty boring. You know, I, I, I think it, a disagreement should be heart and soul. Um, and, uh, you know, people should feel free to kind of throw themselves into it and get a little bit of emotion. And you know what? Emotion helps us think. Now, I mean, this isn't in the book, by the way, but I was just reading a uh, biography of Wittgenstein. And there's a, the, the, you know, the great kind of English, uh, oh, sorry, German, Viennese rather, uh, Austrian philosopher. And he turns up at Bertrand Russell's uh, rooms um, and, and, and they start getting into these arguments over... Uh, mathematical logic, essentially, basically the most abstract, driest topic you can imagine. And in, according to Russell's, kept a diary of it, they were incredibly emotional. They, you know, they were both, particularly Wittgenstein, but both of them would, would get very, very passionate about, about these incredibly arcane disputes. And they made a huge amount of progress because of it, right? That was part of Russell's point. So, you know, we think with our, with, with our emotions, we think best when our emotions are switched on, not when we kind of suppress them or, or take them out of the conversation. 
Um, and yeah, that, that really kind of connects to this idea that actually a little bit of stubbornness, a little bit of stickiness, a little bit of like, yeah, I'm going to push this a little bit further than perhaps I should go here. And suddenly I'm not just going to back down the moment I ex feel, experience any doubt, the moment I think you might be right. Um, if you do that, actually, you're not reaping the full benefit of the disagreement. So you referenced the work of uh, Sherilyn Nemeth, who's been a guest on the program also, and her finding that that uh, being a devil's advocate for the sake of being a devil's advocate uh, doesn't really work very well. You have to actually be able to convince your fellow discussants that you care about it. Talk about that. Yeah, so so I mean, she she's the the expert on this. I mean, she's an expert on on dissent in in particular, and and you know, a lot of companies came to the realization that the the you know group think was bad, right? That was the first kind of like level they got to. Okay, we we shouldn't just have these meetings where the leader speaks and then everyone kind of goes along with what the leader says. There's got to be something somebody giving a contrary point of view. So they appoint people, they give them devil's advocates, you know, and they say. Uh, role and they say, right, you are the one who's got to argue the contrary point of view. And that, according to Nemeth's work, doesn't work as well as when somebody in the group who, who really does believe that the, the, the rest of the group is wrong makes the case, right? It might seem obvious, but it's an actually incredibly, point, incredibly important point. Um, we communicate our arguments much more convincingly and persuasively when, when we believe and when we truly believe in them. The rest of the group can sense that he or she has something at stake, something invested in, in, in this argument, and that it's not just a kind of um, nice intellectual game. Um, and that's the other kind of function of, of emotion in, in an argument. It's a kind of, it's, it, it shows that you are, you, you have a uh, skin in, in this game effectively. Um, and indeed a big theme of, of my book, you know, is, is that I set out lots of kind of rules and, and guidelines for productive disagreement, but the kind of overall, the er rule is you've got to mean it, right? I, you, you can't just approach a disagreement or a difficult conversation um, as, uh, you know, something that you're going to practice a series of little techniques and tricks on. Um, you, you have to manage the conversation as well as you can, but ultimately you have to be authentically interested in what the other person has to say, and you have to be honest about what, what you think as far as much as you can. Um, so yeah, honest emotional investment is, is a really kind of key part of this. Yeah, there's really nothing worse than, than arguing with someone, or better yet, talking with someone. And I think arguing is a subtle word. Having a Sharing yeah. ideas with someone is what I'll call it who's, quote, going through the motions rather than actually engaged yeah. in, the, in the issues that are, that are on the table. Uh, talk about uh, one of the ideas I really loved in the book is uh, that I'd never heard before, and I, I think I'll be using it a lot, is low context versus high context communication via words. You know, we often think of words as just, well, you know, they mean what they mean. But emotion, as you say, plays a huge role and nuance uh, and I like that distinction. Uh, explain what it is. Yeah, so it, the, 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 this comes from anthropology and it comes from um, kind of cross-cultural um, anthropology. So, so it's often used to discuss the differences between different national or regional cultures. Although as, as we'll see, I think it applies in, in, in many more ways than that, but let's just use that because it's kind of an easy model for, for people to grasp. So, High context culture is one in which um, tradition and norms uh, do a lot of the communicating for you. The context does a lot of communicating for you. And actually, you don't actually ne necessarily have to say much, and you certainly don't have to say much directly in order for people to understand your intent and what to do. So an example of a high context culture is, is China and the Asian countries, where you know, when when a group of people are around a table, there's a great a lot. There's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of obliqueness. A lot of subtlety in the way they communicate with each other, and there's a great emphasis on kind of maintaining the relationships in the room, and saying directly what you think, and certainly directly disagreeing with people is is um, frowned upon. Okay, now we're talking about broad brush strokes here. So excuse me, you know, for, for stereotyping, but there's a kind of there's, there's a, the gist of this is 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 true. 
Um, low context culture is where you can't rely on that shared understanding, that common background, those, those norms and traditions um, that you get because everybody's from different backgrounds. It's much more diverse. Um, and there, there just isn't that kind of like that, that commonwealth of, of uh, uh, norms to draw on. And therefore you've got to talk everything out. You've got to use words a lot. Um, so America is a much more low context culture. You've got people from different backgrounds coming into a room together and they, they, they're much more used to just saying, you know, what I think and, 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 and trying to explain everything. Now, what happens when you explain everything and everybody else is explaining what they think, uh, you get a lot more disagreement because suddenly, you know, you realize that everybody has a different point of view and, 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 and some of those points of view will clash. Now, the reason this is so interesting is that the world is just generally moving towards a, a more low context uh, culture everywhere you look, right? The world is becoming more low context because all the things that drive low context cultures, you know, more diversity, more, 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 more kind of higher turnover of, of, of people, um, the, 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 the kind of erasure of traditions, um, the fragmentation of social norms, all those vectors are, are kind of applying to, to more and more countries, in, including China, right? So it might be at different levels, but we're all kind of moving in a low context direction. And the internet is an absolutely low context environment. Uh, where that's taken to an extreme, you know, in some places, particularly on social media, where you're dealing with people where you, you have no idea where they're from. They might be a completely anonymous. You have no idea what, you know, there's no relationship there. There's no kind of uh, shared, we all know, or we all agree on this. Um, there's just you and your words and often the word, just the words. So you don't even have the context of a physical presence or, you know, or someone's voice. If you're on Twitter, you just, you just seeing words in a box. So it's about the most low context form of, of conversation and, 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 and disagreement and argument that you can get. And therefore it's kind of really dry Tinder for, for hostile um, and frequent disagreement. And so really the kind of, you know, I talk about this in the opening chapter because chapter, it's, it's a, a way of saying, look, um, for most of our history as a species and, a, and a, as a culture, we've, been, we've, lived, we've lived in high context environments, right? We, we've lived in environments where uh, we all shared a culture with, with each other. Um, you know, for most of European history, for instance, you know, we, we, were, we were Christian, we were Catholic, and then there's, and then we're Protestant and Catholic, and then everything starts to subdivide, and then you get more, it becomes more and more kind of low context. Um, and uh, we've also just become, we've been able to rely on hierarchy, you know, being told what to think or what to behave. <laughs> Even within the home, right? Just 50 years ago, there was a much stronger sense of, okay, well, the man's gonna do the job and the woman's gonna stay at home and, and Children are, taught, are told what to do by their parents. They don't talk back. You had this kind of whole set of, of norms and, and traditions kind of informing your behavior and giving you a guide to what to think and, and what to do. Much of that has gone away. Now, everybody has, is expected to speak their mind. Everybody's got a point of view. So we live in this raucous, diverse, you know, and I love it. You, I think you do too. You know, it's great. <laughs> um, but it does mean that there's inevitably a lot more conflict and disagreement. And we haven't caught up in terms of thinking about how to do it well, right? So, so nobody comes along and says, here's how you need to, you know, we're going to train you in disagreement at work. You know, in the workplace, there's a huge emphasis on, on getting along, on, on cooperation and on, uh, you know, not treading on each other's toes, and, but very little emphasis on, on disagreeing well. Um, and it's good to have an emphasis on diversity and saying, you know, I want the people around this table to come from different, uh, different backgrounds, different, whether it's religious or gender or ethnic backgrounds. I mean, we should do that just because that's social justice, right? There's a kind of justice reason to do that. There's also a kind of unlocking the benefits of different uh, perspectives on a problem. There's, so there's a kind of uh, that uh, productive productivity reason to do it as well, but you don't unlock that until people, those people, 
disagree with one another. You know, if you have a group of dis- diverse people sitting around a table and they're all just nodding along going, yep, you're absolutely right. Yep, very good. Yep, carry on. Then you, you, certainly from a, a, a productivity or an innovation point of view, it's it's a waste of time. So I really think that we need to get better at it and get more at ease with it in order to unlock the immense benefits of, of, uh, of cognitive diversity. I just thought that idea of, of context, um, you know, on Twitter, sometimes people will make a joke and about some significant portion of the audience doesn't know it's a joke. Now, if you're sitting in the audience, literally at, a, at a, an event where somebody's speaking, there's laughter to cue you and you go, oh, that was a joke. You might see the facial expression of the person who made it. Oh, it was a joke. But without that, mistakes happen all the time. And the part that's, I think, strangest about social media is the ease with which we fill in the context we don't have. So if this person said X, that must mean I've got this huge picture. And it's so many times when I used to spar more on Twitter, sometimes I just write back, you don't know me. (laughs) <laughs> let's just leave it at that. And, or have you read anything I've written besides that last tweet? Uh, you act like you know me, or you, you act like you've been listening to Econ Talk. And I think that, um, you know, underlying all of this conversation we're having is our urge, our need, our desire for connection. And we we don't think about arguing as a way of connecting, but but it is. And it's a form of conversation. It's a form of connecting. It's a way of sharing ideas with, with another human being. And I think when that context gets filled in inaccurately, which when you're limited to 140 characters or whatever Twitter is, you're, uh, you're going to have that happen more often than not. Or when people email quickly, they don't write the long letters of the past where they fill in asides and caveats. They, they are in a hurry and they just dash it off. And people, you know, frequently misinterpret that. And that connection that I think we long for as human beings just gets snapped or a connection we thought we had. And I think that's part of what has gone wrong with social media is this, this the nature of it often causes disconnection rather than connection. Yeah, I think you make a great point, particularly when you say that um, we, we fill in what's what's not there. You know, so the, the problem is not just that it's low context, because you could react to a low context conversation by by being a bit more tentative in your, you know, in the way you approach the subject. Well, you know, I don't know this person. I haven't. I've got no idea about how they arrived at that point of view. So maybe I'm just going to go a little bit easy on them because. Uh, let, let's just tease this out a little bit more and see how we go. No, we don't react like that. <laughs> we go, you terrible person. <laughs> you know, this person is clearly awful. Um, we fill in the blanks and we go, okay, this person fits my stereotype of, you know, A, B or C. And therefore I can do what Tyler Cowan calls devalue and dismiss. You know, I can, oh, I know you, I know your type. Um, and this is, uh, you know, my curiosity just, just shuts down. Um, you know, one of the the antidotes to polarization, and this is there's some empirical evidence for this, and it's also just a kind of intuitively true. Um, one of the antidotes to polarization is, is curiosity. Get, getting actually interested in either in the other person and why they think that, um, or in the evidence that's being discussed. You know, if you can get somebody who says they're um, they don't think climate change is is a problem if they're a a Republican, if you can somehow get them interested in, you know, the ice caps melting, so why why do we think that's happening? Um, Then actually their strong point of view about climate change just sort of like the ice cap dissolves, you know, Um, and they become much more kind of willing to be flexible in their thinking because suddenly that you've kind of piqued their interest and their curiosity um, in the subject. Um, And I think when you get into that mindset of, Ah, oh, this person's disagreeing with me. I'm just going to shove them aside, effectively, mentally, or, or you know, with a with a click of the mouse. And um, then the alternative is to get into uh, a curiosity mindset. 
and say, well, okay, but why does that person think that? And how do they arrive at that, that point of view? And what, what, what's the interesting question that, that our disagreement raises? Well, I think that's part of the challenge of social media right now with the current set of norms is that curiosity is usually just punished or ignored. The problem, I think, with a lot of social media is that you can just run away when you feel like you can, you can throw a grenade and then just can disappear. You can do it anonymously often. Uh, but when two people are together, uh, especially if they're forced together uh, by, by circumstance, they actually have a chance to be curious. And I think um, the other problem, of course, with social media is if you show curiosity, the other members of your team might mock you for treating another person like a human being. For, for imagining yeah. that they could share something with you that they are not evil. And that that's a betrayal of, of the home team. And I think that's part of the reason social media can can be so unproductive. I think, you know, if, as long as you uh, block enough people, you can actually have, I think, good conversations on social media. I've had many. Uh, so I don't want to vilify it per se. But I think I think there's What's missing from social media and what's available in 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 person conversation is the chance to explore things in a way you, it's much much harder to do online. First of all, you get the facial expression, you get the you get the shrug, the gesture. Uh, you can press for more information without fear of being judged. Right? You know, the, the, I, what what are things that I find so painful about Twitter and other uh, public online conversations is, you know. Uh, if you if if you push back at all, you have to then at least it, you have to say. But of course, I don't. You know, I'm not one of those. So you always have to be constantly verifying your bona fides, your credentials as a as a team member. And I think um, it's just a disaster for for yeah, real I mean human <laughs> interaction. It's just a disaster, I, I think, sums it up. I mean, yeah, but the thing is, that's what you're trying to put context back in, right? You're constantly trying to put the context back in. Um, and um, be, because the, the, the context just means that this disagreement is not just about the disagreement. Um, there's a great observation made by Ali Parasa, the guy who coined the, the filter bubble. Um, he said some of the best political disagreements um, that he's, he's witnessed take place on, uh, online um, in sports forums. Um, and it's because the, the context is set, right? The, there's more context there. We're all a fan of this sport. We're all a fan of this team. Okay, so that means that we can have an argument about politics or a discussion of politics without it getting hostile because our relationship is more about, even if we don't know each other, our relationship is already about more than just the disagreement we're having. Right. So so communication scientists talk about these two fundamental levels that are going on in any conversation. There's the relationship level and then and there's the content level. And the content level is the thing that we are talking about, right? The thing that we are verbalizing, whether it's who's going to take the trash out um, <laughs> or, or who should be the next president. Um, and the relationship level is is unspoken, unarticulated, but in some ways it's it's more important, or at least it's, it sort of precedes the content level. The relationship level is, you know, what do you think about me? What do I think about you? Do you like me? Do you respect me? Okay, and that comes across in all sorts of ways. That can come across in, in your the tone of your voice, the particular words that you choose, um, uh, your, your body language, and, and all sorts of other extraneous factors. But until that relationship level, that, that level is settled, unless there's essentially agreement at that relationship level where we're both comfortable with the way that we think the other is, is seeing us, the content level just gets disrupted. It's like, you know, there's a sort of earthquake going on beneath and we're trying to have, the, trying to focus on what we're meant to be talking about, politics or our domestic arrangements or whatever it is. And we can't because we're constantly being kind of um, destabilized from from below. So the really skillful disagreeers, the skillful kind of interlocutors, are always looking for ways to settle that relationship level. And often that means making the other person feel more secure. Um, and, and effectively saying without saying it, you're okay, I'm okay with you, 
you're okay with with me okay um that might be explicitly you know some flattery it might be kind of pointing out that on some things we agree on it might be just signaling that you know you understand that they're a good person you know this 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 disagreement is not about who's a good and a bad person we're both good people here all sorts of ways you can do it but you, you you're trying to kind of because often when you see somebody reacting really irrationally or emotionally or with hostility, you, you, your temptation is to think, well, they're just a terrible person. Maybe they are, right? Some, sometimes they are. But often it's because they feel insecure in some way. They feel like they're, they're risking humiliation. And, and so therefore your job is to reassure them that's not going to happen. That actually we can get into this argument and this disagreement and we're going to both walk away, you know, feeling good about each other. Well, we've been talking mostly about disagreement over politics or, or responsibilities in a marriage. Um, but a lot of your book is about difficult conversations where someone might be caught in the commission of a crime, uh, be in a situation uh, where they are threatening someone physically. Um, and most of the examples in your book are to have happened happy uh, results. The, uh, the the policeman, police officer talks down the the person uh, rather than escalating it into, into, into something worse. Uh, and that happens in the examples you give. I mean, I think it's incredibly important by the person recognizing the humanity of the other person before they tell them what they want. And the most trivial example of this is the the teenager who who comes home late. You have a couple examples of this in the book. The teenager comes home late. The parent's natural response is anger. You've betrayed me. You were supposed to be home by this such such time. And that just causes the other person to dig in their heels. And then what's going to come next is often bad. <laughs> uh, it, it isn't. And the reason is, is that because what's really going on isn't a discussion of whether it's good or bad to come home late. The discussion underlying it, the, the context that's, that's really at stake is, I wanna be an independent human being and you're not letting me be one. And as the parent, the underlying conversation is, I care for you, I'm afraid you're going to do damage to yourself and I, need, I have a need to control you uh, because you used to be very prone to damaging yourself and I have trouble recognizing perhaps that you have gotten older and a little more uh, autonomous and should be. And I think the underlying all of that is this theme we've talked about of respect and the reverse, which is death, is contempt. So if I have contempt for what you're doing and I, I think it's wrong and I tell you so, Instead of you going, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, I'm a, I, that was a horrible decision. What was I thinking, drinking and driving? <laughs> Instead, your brain's going to lock into a different mode as the teenager and defend yourself. You'll find the reason why you had to drink and drive, why you're not going to have a civil, rational conversation. And I think that underlying emotional current, and you talk about it many different ways in the book, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of practical things in your book. But I think of all of them, this might be the most practical, that often a discussion or an argument or a disagreement, especially when there's danger or risk to the relationship, we, our brain is thinking it's about the content, but it's actually not about the content at all. It, it's about yeah. the underlying emotional relationship. And if how hard it is to step back from that, and if you can, you're going to have a better marriage, better friendships. You're going to be more effective at work. I, I just, uh, that's my biggest takeaway. I had a lot of them, by the way. I had a lot of takeaways from your book. But for me, that's so hard to remember. Because when you're saying something foolish, Ian, my brain's saying, what an idiot. And I don't stop and think, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's not foolish. Maybe I'm foolish. I don't stop to think, maybe he said that because I hurt his feelings. And he's just yeah. angry and he's 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 faced with a choice between fight or flight and he chose fight. And he doesn't really mean it, but all I do is fight back. And instead of going back and, and pulling it down, and I think those the, the emotional level and recognizing what's happening beneath the surface. And I think when we think about the art of conversation, 
uh, which I think about a lot, obviously, as the host of a, of a podcast, I think that emotional piece of it, what's happening under the surface, is the deepest challenging piece of being, I think, a, a first-rate conversationalist. I agree. And it's the most um, cognitively demanding part of the whole exercise because you're, you're, you're trying to concentrate on what you want to say on that kind of content level. And at the same time, you have to reserve some of your brain for, you know, the relationship level, like how's this going? How's this person responding to, to me? Are they feeling insecure or not? Um, and I, I love kind of talking to people who do this in extreme situations. So as you know, I talk to interrogation experts and hostage negotiators and so on, because the really good ones are kind of, they are very, very skilled at working on, on those different levels. But I think it's something we all have to do to some, to some degree. But when you're, when you're interrogating somebody, and I knew this because I actually role played an interrogation where they got an actor to play a criminal and it was really horrifically hard to, to do because with your, with your kind of like content brain, you're, you're, you're thinking about all the details of the case and the evidence and the, what information they might have in their brain and what information you need to get out of it in order for this interrogation to go well. That's very intellectually demanding. But at the same time, you're dealing with somebody who really doesn't want to talk to you or wants to upset you or annoy you, you know, who wants the conversation to go badly, effectively. And you're trying to manage that conversation as well. Um, and so you're working on these kind of like these, these different levels. Um, but I, I mean, another, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. The, the other kind of, you know, this is another way of saying what you've just been saying, which is you've got to try and avoid the conversation turning into a struggle for dominance. That's really how many, many disagreements go wrong. They become power struggles. And the really skilled um, interrogators, for instance, do not walk into the room. It's not like you see on TV and in, in, in the movies, at least the, the good ones don't behave like this. They don't walk into the room and sort of bang the table and say, All right, you tell me what you, kn you know, otherwise we're gonna whatever. Um, because they know actually that's entirely counterproductive. What, what, what you get, what you then get is, is you're just shutting the other person down effectively. You, in fact, you're making it easy for them. You know, they're trained for, and, and certainly mentally prepared for that situation. And the moment you do that, it's like, fine, well, I'm in a power struggle. Um, I don't have to say anything. Now the really skilled interrogators w walk into the room and they make a big deal of the fact that you have the right not to talk. You know, they don't mumble past that bit. You know, the different rights in diff different countries. But over here, you know, they have the right not to talk. They have the right for a lawyer. They, they can leave the room if they don't ha actually have to subject themselves to the interrogation. And inexperienced cops will just sort of mumble over that part, saying, right, you have the right not to talk. Anyway, and the, the, the really skilled interrogators will actually walk into the room and say, look, I can't make you talk. You, you, you can absolutely not say anything. In fact, you can you can leave the room, right? I can't tell you what to do. Um, this lawyer can't tell you what to do. My colleague, none of us can tell you what to do. So it's, it's up to you. Um, but I would just really like to understand how you got here. I'm interested. And they are. They're, by the way, they're genuinely curious people, right? They're, they're really, this is not just a, a, a sort of trick. And these hardened elite terrorists who've been trained for this situation for years just sort of open up um, and, and gush, you know, um, and tell their story because they really do want to tell the story, right? It's just the pressure is building up inside them. Um, and you're just basically kind of opening the, the floodgate and let, letting it come out rather than pushing them away, which is what you're doing when you say, right, you need to tell me what you know now. Um, and you see that again and again in difficult conversations. So you talk to addiction therapists, and they'll say, you know, this is what we learned in the last few decades of addiction therapies. For a long time, we thought the, the answer was you sit down with the, the addict and you say, you have a really, really serious problem and you need to, to confront it. You're damaging your life. You're damaging the life of the, of the people around you, the people that you love. And, and they'll say, no, I don't have a problem. No, I don't. it's absolutely fine. I've got this under control. OK, I just need to make a few adjustment, adjustments. And they just get into this back and forth argument because the moment somebody's told you've got a serious problem, you need to stop drinking or taking drugs, the moment the, the big part of their brain, which hates being dominated, kind of is uh, more, becomes more vocal in, in their internal 
dialogue and says, hey, no, it's fine. I don't need, you're not going to tell me what to do. I like drinking, right? It's a big part of my life. So what the addiction therapists realize and what they, they're now much more likely to, to practice is you go in there and you say, you tell me what's going on. I, I, I'm interested. I want, I want to know why you're here and because clearly you wouldn't be here unless there's some sort of issue in your life and and then they listen. Um, and now, doesn't mean that they don't have a point of view in the conversation, right? They can still kind of guide the addict towards where, where they want them to go. But they do, they make every effort they can not to be perceived as domineering or subtly, even subtly domineering. They're not trying to persuade them. They're saying, look, I'm, I'm here for you and I'm, I, and I'm interested in you and I want to help you kind of work out the best way. And then when the addict works it out for themselves, they're much more likely to follow through and, and ch on change. And they're much more motivated. Now, I just think you, you can apply that principle in so many different ways to, to your own life, including, yeah, your conversations with, with children. In fact, the, the, the interrogation, main interrogation expert I, I, I talked to, Lawrence Allison, who trains uh, counter-terrorist police um, from around the world, he said, one of the first things I say to them is, listen, if you can deal with teenagers well, you can deal with terrorists. It's the same <laughs> basic principle. Oh, for yeah, well, that's that's the challenge. Teenagers are challenging. Yeah, um, not that it's easy. Yeah, yeah. it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. But I think I think there's something incredibly deep there, which is the, you know, if I if you if you have an addiction, and someone says to you, uh, "This is ruining your life," the person knows it often, right? I, I know many things that I do that aren't good for me that I wish I didn't do. When you tell me that, my first reaction isn't. Oh, I didn't realize that. My first reaction is, you think I'm a loser. It's not so. It's not just dominance. It's the respect issue, um, and I think that emotional subcurrent of respect and and versus contempt. I'm going to use a really uh, a risky metaphor, Ian. I, I hope it works for you, uh, which is baseball. Now, if baseball doesn't work for you. I, I suspect cricket might. Am, am I? Yeah, that would be better. But keep going with baseball. I, I, okay. I can manage. So I apologize for people who don't have either baseball or cricket. Um, but in baseball, one of the most horrible things that every coach says and every parent, and I said it many times, is keep your eye on the ball if you're batting. You got It's a hard thing. You got to hit a fast-moving object with a little stick, and it's challenging. So obviously, keep your eye on the ball, right? One, one reaction to that advice is, uh, well, of course. But I think what coaches and parents, and this is where econ talks really practical, by the way. So if you're a little league coach or parent, uh, I'm going to give you some really powerful, useful advice here. Uh, to swing a baseball bat with power, uh, you have to have your body go counterclockwise. You're basically turning, if you're a right-handed batter, you're turning your body uh, counterclockwise to swing the bat as the ball comes forward. The challenge is, you have to move your head clockwise as the ball comes in because as the ball's coming toward you and comes to the area of the hitting zone, you have to start to turn your head to follow it. And to do that, your head starts, if you're a right-handed batter, your head turns clockwise. So you're doing something that is actually something like rubbing your, patting your stomach and rubbing your head or vice versa. And it, that's what you have to practice, not quote, keeping your eye on the ball, but practice the art of keeping your eye on the ball means doing two things that actually are somewhat unnatural. And I think discussion has that character. Like you said, someone's saying something and I'm thinking, oh, I can answer that. I have an answer to that. I have an answer to that. And your brain's working away. I can, I can do that. There's this other part of your brain, which you have to engage at the same time, not intuitive, because that first part's aggressive. That first part is uh, is uh, is um, I'm going against you. I'm 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 bumping back. You're 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 pushing something. Me, I'm pushing back. But I also have to invite you in. But at the same time, I'm pushing back. So my brain says, I disagree. I disagree. Here's my argument. What's my best argument? Oh yeah, I'll find it. But at the same time, I have to be saying, I'm listening. I'm taking it in. And I think that art of doing both at the same time, and maybe you can't do both. Maybe it's not like baseball. 
uh, or maybe it's just as hard as hitting a baseball. But I think that's that's the challenge. I, I think I've told the story here. I once had a family member insult me, and um, I'd written an essay that morning about seeing yourself as part of an ensemble rather than as the star of the show. And so I really wanted to be the star of the show when I was insulted. I wanted to push back and defend myself. But I'd written that essay, and it was haunting me. <laughs> I said instead, oh, maybe the, this person needs me to be somebody else other than the adversary. And instead of being adversarial, I just took it. And it hurt. And it was one of the most extraordinary emotional experiences I've ever had. Because instead of going into that very natural adversarial mode, I could see myself as giving what the other person needed, which was an ear. Yeah. They wanted me to accept that criticism. And I realized, yeah. you know, it's probably a fair criticism. I have a lot of answers, but I'm not going to say them. And I just took it. And I think that mixture of adversarial pushback versus embracing the viewpoint and, and, and status, prestige of the other person as a fellow human being is really what you need to try to foster as a, as a conversationalist. Uh, yeah, I think that's beautifully put. And I, and I think it, it's, it's, you know, it, it is about, you know, thinking about the content, the thing that we are ar arguing about, but at the same time, acknowledging that the relationship is also important. And in fact, it's probably more important. Um, and that sometimes you have to kind of compromise on the first in order that the, the second, is, you know, is repaired um, or isn't harmed. But then once that relationship level is settled, then you're going to have better disagreements and, 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 and be better, better arguments. That's the thing. Um, and I often think about, you know, the book is not about persuasion, right? But obviously it, 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 it overlaps with it. Um, and there's often, we often have this kind of fantasy, a bit like an old fashioned addiction therapist who thinks if I tell this person that they've got a serious problem, they'll go, oh yes, you're right. What have I been thinking? We have this fantasy <laughs> that, that we will say, look, climate change is real. Here's the evidence. How date? And the other person's going to go, oh my God. What was I thinking? Wow. <laughs> you're, yeah. I've been an idiot all my life. Yeah. Right. This is not going to happen. Or vice versa, Ian. <laughs> Right. Well, vice versa, I can show right, you yeah. that some of the things that are claimed by climate change folks maybe aren't true, in which yeah, case. Yeah. But strangely enough, they don't go, what if I've been living alive for the last 10 years? No, exactly. Because it becomes an attack on their identity. Right. Or on I, your I identity. I interrupted that because you picked a couple examples that only looked at one side, but the book's quite even handed. Really? I just want to say that out of respect yes. that that in the book and in particular, when you talk about the Branch Davidians versus the FBI and the Waco tragedy, uh, the Branch Davidians come off better than the FBI, which I thought was quite quite impressive. Yeah, I mean the th the thing about the kind of the the I, I guess in inverted commas liberal or, or, or kind of analytical or, or educated mindset. I'm merging a few different things together there, but uh, what Joe Heinrich calls the the weird mindset, you know, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, is we have a kind of double jeopardy because not only do we have our own kind of way of thinking, analytical and, and, and kind of um, logical, um, we also think it's the only way of thinking there is. <laughs> so whenever we meet somebody who doesn't think like that, we just think, oh, you're just being idiotic or irrational or over emotional and so on. Um, and so, uh, and, and actually, when you look at the 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 way that in politically you know liberals versus conservatives liberals are, are even worse at understanding how conservatives think than 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 vice versa um because they were, kind of tend to be even more kind of analytical even more kind of low context in a way in the, in the way they think about things um so yes i i think just we are we are now kind of used to the idea that other cultures think differently um we're not quite used to the idea that our own cult, we have a culture of our own. We don't, we're not just normal, you know, 
<laughs> whoever we are, um, we, 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 we're we odd in our own way and we need to kind of reflect on that as we're engaging with somebody else. I think that's particularly true in marriage uh, or friendship where inevitably, I mean, there's certain male-female stereotypes which we won't, we won't list here, but it doesn't really matter. The, the really important point is no, whether you're male, female, or, or something else, you have you bring your own stuff, your own baggage, your own history to the to the conversation. I and I I'm going to segue into something I, I wanted to make sure we we talked about, which is that uh, especially related to this low context, high context. You know, we had Dana Joy on here, and he talked really eloquently, the poet, about the private language uh, in one of his poems that that married couples have, and married couples they can get by in semi-silence for a very long time because they don't need much you know, expansion of the words. They, they, can, they can tweet back and forth to each other quite effectively because they have a lifetime of practice. That's the, good, that's the good side. The bad side is, well, actually, if anybody changes, the other person often has zero awareness of it because they've, they've, they've filled in the script for years. They know what the other person is going to say. They know what they think. And they forget the possibility that that you can change. And I think that it, that's true of friendship. It's true of marriage, obviously. It's true of work as well. That that some of these high context situations where so much communication takes place without explicit words is actually has this this little challenge on the side that sometimes you're 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 debating, arguing with somebody who doesn't exist. You're arguing with the person, the spouse of yours that that you've imagined for the last five years, who's not the same. Absolutely, and, and, and there's this just really interesting line of research in into empathetic mind reading. You know, how well do do couples understand each other? How well can they read each other's minds? Um, and, and, and sort of identify what the other's thinking and feeling. And one of the fascinating things about it is that long-term couples uh, tend to get a little worse at reading each other's minds as time goes on. So they improve steeply over the, the opening kind of months and years of the relationship um, until they perform this you know, incredible mind melds that you see with with couples uh, where, where, you know, you're just finishing each other's sentences. You know that when somebody's in a bad mood, it's because, you know, they've, they've, they've just encountered somebody that they don't like, or they haven't had breakfast. But, you know, you, you, can, you, you can kind of read them. You've got a very good mental model of, of how they operate. But then what happens is over time, because that model worked so well, the other person is changing over time, right? As you say, you know, you don't kind of become a completely static person at the age of 25 or even 35. You're having different experiences and different thoughts as you go. But because the, your partner had that model of, of how you think and, and he or she's relying on that model, she doesn't notice or he doesn't notice that you're changing. Um, and, and the model doesn't get updated until something goes badly wrong. Um, and you know, suddenly you realize, actually, this person is, is not the person that they were 10, 15 years ago, and they've evolved, and I haven't kind of kept up with them. Um, and so this is another role for, for argument and disagreement, because there's a lot of evidence that couples who, who are quite quick to get into arguments, not necessarily major ones, but kind of little ones, are actually happier and more fulfilled and more likely to stay together than couples who, who never rise to argument, who are always calm and talk everything through. I hate those couples. Um, and I thought this is interesting because, you know, we tend to assume the opposite, that the couples who argue a lot are, are, are going to be unhappy. But actually, the ones who argue, they're getting new information. You know, they're updating, you know, kind of almost in a Bayesian sense, their model of the other person. Because in an argument, as I was saying earlier, you suddenly find out, oh, she really cares about this <laughs> in a way that I hadn't worked out or... Oh, that's what he really thinks. Oh, right. Okay. Um, and so you're getting these little, these, these updates to your model. You're blowing away the stereotype that you've formed of, of, of your partner. Um, and therefore you're, you're, you're keeping the relationship strong. You know, relationship is like an organism and, you know, there's, it needs to evolve and, and change and conflict is, is a big, is a big driver of, of that change. What have, what did you learn from this book other than what you wrote in it? So you wrote a lot of, there's some really wonderful 
stories. Um, we didn't get to all of them. Uh, I'm just going to mention it because it's been mentioned before on the program. We talk about how the Wright brothers argued all the time, but it helped them yeah. discover some ex- extraordinarily practical things that otherwise they were always trial and error was a huge part of what they were doing. Obviously, there was no science of flight. They were inventing it essentially in, in real space. Um, so uh, you tell some great stories. You give some good practical advice. Uh, you provoke my thinking. I'm curious what happened to you. You spent a lot of time became, talking to – go ahead. I would say I became more uh, prepared to have direct and open disagreements with people. And by and by more prepared, I mean not just more willing, but literally more prepared in that, that I'm, more, I'm more prepared to have them because I've given some thought to – to how to make this go well. Um, you know, part of the reason I wrote the book is that I'm not a very conflict, I, I don't really like it. I'm <laughs> probably pretty conflict averse even by most people's standards. Um, and so, I, I, and, and, and you know, I, I lie, as we've been talking about all the benefits of it. And so I don't want to miss out on those. And I've realized that actually it's always going to be, a, not always, but it's usually going to be quite uncomfortable. But if you give some thought to how to approach it, and actually if you practice it more, the, the, the more comfortable you get with it. I mean, in a small way, right, my, my marriage has been changed by this because I'm more likely to have arguments out with my wife now, right? We don't really have kind of necessarily major, you know, we don't tearing strips of each other, but we'll have kind of, you know, fairly heated disagreements about things and we'll do it in front of the children in a way that I perhaps wouldn't have done with, you know, was not particularly happy about doing before because I want them to see that it's okay. You know, we, you can have a disagreement with someone you love and you, you, you still love them instead of saying to my wife, you know, let's talk about this in another room let's, as if it's something shameful, you know, that we're about yeah. to have a conflict of, of, of opinion on, on, on a subject to do with a family. Um, and so the children kind of grow up in a, in a culture where it's okay to have open disagreement. In fact, that's kind of, you know, part of what makes life interesting and enjoyable. Um, I mean, they've taken that lesson a little bit too much to heart um, for my, for my comfort that, you know, they, uh, <clears throat> talk back to me just about just about everything um but um but that's fine that's that's actually you know that's that's the way i wanted it may i ask where you're from originally i'm from london um lived in london uh all my life apart from a, a few years in new york so um, my my stereotype whether it's accurate or not is that people from england tend to be very very high context uh they tend to keep uh, their deepest feelings uh, under wraps if they are confrontational or going to lead to confrontation. You know, the the the, the story I like, I, I, I'm sure it's true. I'm sure it's happened a thousand times. The American who goes to London for a business presentation and is told afterward by the team from England, oh, that was that was fine. But that means awful. <laughs> is what is what I've heard. I don't know if that's true. I've never made a business business presentation in London, but I think if you don't know that, obviously, uh, and and um, you know the the example I've used many times in the program is the uh, is asking my Russian friend how are you, and he says fine, like all Americans, because Americans <laughs> don't like to talk about how they feel in that setting. It's just a conversational gambit. It doesn't mean. How are you? It means I'm starting talking now. And so I think, you know, those, uh, I, I don't know if that's fair. And so I, I'm, I'm challenging a little bit. Is it, is it true that, that do you think it's true that in the culture that you were raised in, that arguing was considered gauche? It, it certainly, uh, in, in certain cultures, it is gauche. And in other cultures, it's celebrated. Do you feel that's, that was true of the way you were raised? Yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the, the kind of high context English culture of, of um, ambiguity um, and sort of a very refined kind of 
elaborate civility um, is somewhat on the decline, right? For better mm -hmm. yeah. and for worse. There were nice things yeah. about that and there were not nice things about that. Yep. Um, but I, I think probably compared to some other cultures, there's probably less openness to, to conflict and disagreement. But, I mean, so I spoke to, um, I mentioned this in the book just briefly, but I, I, I spoke to uh, a French journalist. I uh, lived in Paris actually for a couple of months when I was writing the book. And we were talking about the differences between French and English culture. And I said, you know, we have this thing, I'm sure you have it too, where you don't discuss religion or politics at the dinner table. And she was like, what? <laughs> this is crazy. She, she, she said, you know, this is the whole, for us, it's the whole point, right? You know, you, you sit around, you, you sit at the table, you, there's a couple of minutes of nice, polite chit chat, and everybody's waiting for somebody to throw a grenade into the conversation, right? Let's talk about the gilet jaune. Oh, you think the gilet jaune's a good thing, do you? And then we get into it. And she said, that's the whole point of sitting down for lunch and where, where I'm from. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, they have a kind of culture of, of argument and positive argument. And and as I've been saying, you know, you can we're talking about this in national terms, regional terms, because it's easy to to get your head around. But you, you can you can create the culture you want, right? There's obviously lots of different cultures inside every country, and inside an organisation that they will have, you know, each organisation will have its own culture of of disagreement and an argument. Um, and I kind of make the case that you know you know you need to be kind of creating a culture of disagreement, where disagreement is not seen as a, a disruptive behavior or a, a, a personal slight, but it's actually seen as a positive contribution to, to the company and as a sign of respect to your colleagues. Yeah, in terms of leadership, we can close on this. Uh, in terms of leadership, um, creating that culture of of trust is, is very challenging, I think. Uh, I used to be involved with, with the business community of St. Louis in, in Missouri because I was in the business school at, at Washington University. And um, there were certain organizations that were well known as being places where people, you know, argued vehemently with each other and it was encouraged and accepted and nobody judged it. And there were others that were much more straight laced, buttoned up, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I think you know, the ideal is to create a, a culture of trust where people know they won't get fired uh, if they say something that other people disagree with. But I don't think, I think it's not so straightforward. It's kind of a hard, it's an art, obviously, of, of leadership. Well, I, I think you, almost more than that, I almost think that's not, you should aim higher, one should aim higher than that and try and create a culture where uh, not sharing your opinion, if you have an informed opinion on a topic, is a bad thing. That's what you get into into trouble with. Um, if you come along and say, "Well, I, at the time I thought this, but I didn't say so," that's that's a problem. Um, and that and that people who disagree openly and and respectfully, but but openly and directly, are rewarded for it, including and especially when they do it to their boss, um, because it, that's the only way to unlock all these these immense cognitive collective benefits. Um, of, of of disagreement, you know. I tell you, the company that's really good at this. I actually don't mention them in the book because uh, I only read his book, Reed Hastings' book, No Rules Rules. Um, he talks about the Netflix culture that he's created. Then he puts a great emphasis on 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 disagreement, and people who join Netflix are often surprised and uncomfortable at first when they see somebody relatively junior disagreeing with. Reed Hastings, or you know, whoever is, is the most senior person in in the room, and they have a kind of big argument. And if you're a newcomer, you think, "Whoa, that didn't go well." But then they see the boss kind of go around and congratulate that person at the end and say, "Look, you know, actually, whether or not they agreed with them at the end of the conversation is sort of irrelevant." They're like, "Congratulations, that, you know, you did a great job of disagreeing with me there and, and making me think through my premises." Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I think that is the best insurance against a high number of bad decisions. You know, I, I think if you've got people in the room who are putting forward different points of view and really giving your view, especially if you're a leader, a bit of a battering, it's going to make your, your whether or not you stick to your decision or not, or you change your mind, it's going to make where you end up stronger. Um, and I think you can model it too. You know, you, you, can, 
you can have arguments a bit like me and my wife you know <laughs> talking in front of the kids you can yeah. do it with your peers in the room you can say look we're, we're you can show you can model kind of good positive disagreement in front of uh, your, your more junior employees and we had david epstein on the program talking about oh, his book man, i think yeah. it was i think it was it was book range and uh, in there i think it's that i've got this right he talks about the challenger tragedy and and the space shuttle launch and nasa had a motto in god we trust everyone else bring data it's literally a banner on the wall uh i'm told I've read. Uh, so the engineers who are worried about the O-rings and the temperature on the day of the Challenger launch uh, didn't have any data because they'd never launched on a, such a cold day. Uh, they'd never directly tested it, but they were very uneasy about it. Uh, and when they raised the, the issue, the NASA people really were eager to launch because if they didn't launch that day, it was going to be cold for a few days. It was going to be put off for a certain amount of time. And then they'd already brought the plane that you know the rocket out of the warehouse and it meant it had been on the be on the pad too long and they'd have to take it it was just really unpleasant and would be viewed badly obviously even just because it would wouldn't get the job done and the engineers who understood that there was a risk here I think have suffered since then because and I've read some of the accounts of this you know that they knew there was something wrong they spoke up so it wasn't like they stayed silent, but it came, comes back to our earlier discussion. They weren't vehement enough. Yeah. And they, of course, have tragic regrets about it uh, to some extent. Uh, that, you know, it caused a lot of soul searching at, at NASA, obviously. You know, and of course, the irony is, is that the, you know, it was the profit oriented company that was trying to stop the launch, not the government so-called public spirited people. And, and that, forced NASA to examine their culture of disagreement and the importance of disagreement. And I think the, um, you know, this, this lesson of knowledge being spread out in individual people and that to get it used, we have to be able to trust one another to share it without punishment, without fear of, of being held, in, you know, as, as contemptible, I think is just, it's the definition of, I think, a healthy organization. And a healthy family. Agreed, and and yeah, as you say that that the the responsibility there is not just with the individual engineers to be more right. vehement. It's with the leadership to say it's okay if you really strongly believe something. Yeah, stand up and t you know shout if you need to do. <laughs> Lives are at stake, right? It couldn't yeah. be more important. Yeah. Um. So and sometimes yeah, you just get corporate cultures where. Any expression of real passion or emotion is sort of slightly frowned upon and everybody's got to be very calm and rational and logical. That actually means you're reducing the amount of information you're getting from people because the way you talk, your, your tone gives information about what's going on as much as, as what you're saying. Um, so creating room for kind of emotional range and tonal variety in conversations is as important as just the content of what we're, you know, the information that we're all exchanging. My guest today has been Ian Leslie. His book is Conflicted. Ian, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you so much, Russ. Really enjoyed it. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for EconTalk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.